About a year ago, I figured out that you can take your favorite fruit and grow the seed into a plant. Well, I love lychees, or lychees, don't come at me, but they're pretty hard to grow. I put a few of the seeds on a damp piece of paper towel, sealed them in a glass jar airtight, and what do you know? The tail started to sprout after just seven days. I kept them in the paper towel for three more weeks and I kept checking them every few days to make sure that they were growing nicely. I also made sure to keep the piece of paper towel they were living on damp, so I spritzed that about every three days. After those three weeks passed what felt like a whole lifetime, the little tails were finally ready to poke their bums in some soil. I planted it in soil and it grew into the most cute plant ever. But since I had three seeds germinating, I left the other two on the paper towel to germinate and this is what they looked like. So I decided to also plant this seedling in soil too. And it started to sprout up so nicely I was very excited. I was a bit confused though to see that the leaves sprouted up red, not green. The red leaves in a lychee plant are typically a sign of new growth and as the leaves mature they often turn green. This is a common occurrence in many plants where the young leaves have a different color than the mature ones. It's just nature doing its thing, nothing to worry about and as they grew they did turn green and as I looked closer I noticed that some of the leaves looked like they were being eaten by some sort of critter and upon taking a closer look there most definitely was something eating these leaves but I didn't see any aphids so it must have been a caterpillar or an ant but I put it in a new spot in hopes the bugs wouldn't be in the new corner I chose and I repotted it as it outgrew its old pot and even though the leaves were a little bit bitten they never fully recovered and grew back that is still okay because soon I started to see new shoots poking out and at this time it was around August so I thought we were okay to leave it outside because it was technically still summer here in Canada that doesn't end till about November but for some reason the plant was having a hard time the leaves leaves started to droop a bit and fade in color. Not all of the leaves, but some of them. And at this point, I was confused because I was doing everything right. So I figured, let's just let nature do its thing, and if we're meant to have a lychee tree, then we will. After all, lychees have a romantic history. Legend has it that in ancient China, the emperor bestowed lychees upon his favorite concubine as a token of his love. And that is all that I had to do. Give these lychees a sweet gesture and a token of my love. So I decided to bring it inside and let it live under my grow lights and I started to save its life, okay? I'm basically God because this thing survived the entire winter under those grow lights. Although it didn't grow too much bigger, the droopy leaves had life back in them and it was looking alive and well and ready to be put back outside for the summer. But here's where I really learned that plants are all trial and <coughs> because for some reason the plant started to lose its leaves when I put it outside and I figured, okay, maybe it's just that it went through a shock from the weather change from the indoor to the outdoors and since the roots at the bottom were probably still white and alive because the stem was still green I figured let's just leave it let it do its thing let it grow back the leaves since that's happened before with other plants I've grown like my lemon plant but I don't really know why it didn't grow back for a full year the stem just stayed like this it was just not thriving and listen, if you know anything about me and my channel, you know that I was not happy with these results. So of course, I got one more round of lychees to try again, because after all, it had almost been two years now with this plant, and I really did not want to give up until I had my lychee plant that was green, alive, and thriving. So you know the drill, I got the seeds all knocked up and germinated, and then got them in soil and waited. This was the progress of that plant. It grew up so nicely, I was pumped. The leaves were green, porcelain, and doing really well. So as it grew, I got hungry for more exotic lychee-like fruits and learned about lychee's little brother. This hairy fruit called rambutan or rambutan, don't come at me again for the pronunciation, but it kind of looks like a lychee when you open it, and they're part of the same family, the soap berry family. At first, I thought this was a creature that came straight from the crevasses of the deep sea, but it's not. I just found them so cool, especially because they were named rambutans because of their hair-like spikes and because the word rambut 
and malle means hair. They've got a reddish rind with long soft spikes and when you open it you reveal the white flesh and even though it looks like a lychee it actually tastes more like a strawberry mango steam kiwi hybrid. It's really good. And listen I know it can take up to six years to grow and fruit but you can get up to 6,000 pieces of rambutan per season so it's definitely worth it and I even found out that you can snack on the seeds. They're edible. That forbidden almond becomes like a snack. I haven't personally done that because we've got to grow the seeds instead of eat the seeds and that's what we're doing. And you won't believe what happened. I was so excited to have a little plant. I revealed the seed and I had to be careful not to break the seed inside of the flesh because at first I tried peeling that outer layer of skin off of the seeds because I usually do that with most of the seeds. But that was a bad idea because I broke the seed. So I just left that layer on the rest of the seeds and I was kind of surprised at how weak the seeds were. But then I remembered they're edible so I guess that makes more sense. But once I had my seeds, I got some on a damp piece of paper towel to germinate and I planted others in soil you know gotta give us options just in case one happened to fail because we all know my fail rates can be quite high at some times but anywho soon time passed but for some reason they just got all moldy the ones in the paper towel looked like this I refused to even open it because that was like the worst mold gross stuff I've ever seen and the ones in soil just never grew so I guess it's safe to say that this fruit might need stratification which is just putting the seeds in the fridge or out in the winter weather to experience a cold period to promote germination of seedlings. But I wanted to try again once the winter passed and the summer sun came back out. I just really wanted to grow the hairy balls of nature. So I got my hands on one more round of rambutans and tried again, but this time with a south facing view instead of a north. And I got to work. You already know the drill. I opened them, removed the flesh, revealed the seed, placed some seeds on a damp piece of paper towel ready to germinate airtight in a glass jar. You can also use a little plastic bag. And then I placed the rest of the seeds in soil to see if they would grow in a little pot. As I wait for my rambutan plant to grow, I found out that not only do lychees have a little brother, but they also have a little sister and her name is Longan. Longans are straight up mandrake seeds from Harry Potter and we needed one of these things growing in the garden. They're also a member of the soap berry family like rambutan and lychee. So I grabbed the seeds and got to work, you know the drill. When you break them open you reveal the glossy translucent flesh like a lychee but more musky. It's chewy and a bit rubbery and kind of reminds me of a mochi tapioca hybrid. It tastes so good. Well I removed the glossy flesh and revealed those naked seeds and got them on a piece of damp paper towel to jerk so cool because the name Longan translates to dragon eye in Chinese and rightfully so because the shiny black seeds resemble an eyeball. Well these dragon eyes grew tails so fast in just three days they started to break open and grow. So once the tails were long enough I planted them in soil and waited for the growth of our baby Longan plant. It was growing really nicely. I was a proud mother and as it sprouted I also left some seeds in the paper towel to grow even bigger. I didn't plant all of them. And this is what the progress of those seeds looked like. So once the tails on those were real long, I planted those in another bed of soil too. And both plants were doing really well. I repotted them as needed. And at this time, it was around the end of the summer. So like our lychee plant, I planned to bring it inside soon to live under the grow light. For a while it was doing well, but then the winter came and it kind of messed everything up because here in Canada, these plants just can't grow, eh? Well listen, even if a plant looks dead, you gotta look underneath at the roots. If they're white and they've got life left in them, they can grow, turn green, survive and thrive. And if there are any leaves, you're good to save the life of that plant. But if the roots are black, you might not have as much luck. But as this long end grew, just like the lychee, it also started to get some yellow leaves but there was still some nice green growth. So I tried my best to let nature do its thing and what do you know? The yellow parts of the leaves started to turn green again and that's evidence on why you need to trust the process. I thanked nature and then brought the plant inside and now we wait for our long end plant to see if it thrives throughout the winter inside. So my friends, this was the two to three year journey of our attempts at growing the members of the soap fairy family. We grew lychees, rambutans, longans, and learned about the trials and errors associated with growing these exotic fruits in an urban environment and in a cold place just like Canadia. These sweet, juicy, fleshed fruits are all known for their distinct flavors, rightfully so because they're so tasty. And I'm just so excited to see what will happen with the growth of these plants in the future.
I heard that you can grow your own papayas from store-bought papayas in just 18 months, and I didn't believe it, so I tried it myself. And spoiler alert, what happened here was the ultimate proof on why you should grow your own plants from the seeds inside of fruit too. I mean, why just buy a plant when you can grow it from scratch and make your backyard the coolest place in town? Right? <laughs> well, to tell a story right, you gotta start from the beginning, so let's rewind to two years ago, shall we? It all started with this papaya right here. First, I broke open my papaya, revealed the dark little seeds, removed some, and then I broke open that outer gelatinous membrane to reveal the inner seed. It's really hairy, and it's also a lot of fun to break them open just like this. You gotta make sure to remove that outer layer of flesh off the seed and get them on a damp piece of paper towel so you give them a nice home to germinate. Not Germany, but germinate. I decided to leave that outer hairy layer on some of the seeds and peel some off of others just in case one method worked better than the other in growing baby tails because remember, this was the very first time I was ever attempting to grow papayas from seed and if we wanted that to happen in 18 months, we needed options. Some of the seeds also came like this without that outer gelatinous hairy membrane layer. So of course, if you know anything about this channel, we try many different ways of growing to make sure we're successful so you already know that I put the seeds with the hairy layer still on them and the seeds with the hairy layer peeled off and the seeds that didn't come with the hairy layer at all on a damp piece of paper towel in orderly fashion, of course. And then I sealed that up in a little bag and the hardest part came waiting to see if the seeds would sprout or not. By the way, if you're trying this at home, you can also seal it up in a glass jar instead of a little bag and then wait for your growth. But the hardest part really is waiting because it can take anywhere from three weeks to three months for the baby seeds to sprout baby tails. So if you do try this, you'll learn the true value of patience. But I was also curious about the rate of germination and how that really happened, why it could take three weeks or three months. So I also tried experimenting with some seeds by placing one in a dark place and the second one in a sunny place by my window. I really just wanted to see which ones would sprout faster since there was such a big stretch of time where the seeds could grow or not. Well, it took my seeds exactly seven weeks to germinate and I was so excited to open my paper towel to see the little baby tails starting to form on some of the little seeds. And after I experimented, I found that the seeds that sat in the sunny spot sprouted in about seven weeks, whereas the seeds that sat in the dark spot sprouted in three months. So we know the true answer there, keep them in a sunny spot. And the seeds that had the outer hairy layer grew faster than the ones that we peeled the hairy layer off of. These were in fact a few cool things to learn as I was becoming a papaya expert. Plus I heard that you can grow a papaya tree in just 18 months, a full blown tree that fruits papayas in your own backyard. Yard. So I was really pumped to see these little tails growing, but I was skeptical that papaya trees could actually grow and fruit all in under a year and a half. But I learned that papaya plants are known for their element of fast growth. They can grow several feet in a year under ideal conditions, and that's why they're such a popular choice for tropical and subtropical home gardens. And that really means that with a warm climate, the right papaya variety, optimal care, and protection from the cold can all help you grow papayas in less than 18 months in your own backyard or on your balcony if you're growing fruits like us in an urban environment, because that is possible. I'm doing it myself. Anywho, once the little tails grew even more, about three weeks more of leaving them in the paper towel, they were finally ready to transplant into a little bit of soil. So of course, you already know I did just that. I was darn well pumped to watch our baby papaya tree begin to grow. Even though the fruit ain't so pretty, you can darn well bet your bottom that the cute little baby plant most definitely is. And as I watched the growth of our baby papaya plant grow, I learned that if you're using papaya seeds from a grocery store to grow, it's most likely going to be a bisexual plant. There are actually three different types, male, female, and bisexual plants. It's the female and bisexual plants that are the only ones that produce fruit. And you may be thinking right now, well, my lady, you might actually have meant to say by gender, but nope, I meant bisexual. Because bisexual as a term is actually used in botany pretty often, and it just means dual sexes. And now you might be thinking, well, my lady, what makes them bisexual? Well, first off, they're bisexual flowers. So papaya plants produce both male and female flowers 
on the same plant, and the presence of both male and female reproductive organs within a single flower is what makes them bisexual. Probably a mouthful, right? Well, let me explain. The male flowers typically have a long, slender stalk, and they produce the pollen. The female papaya flowers are pretty big and usually located closer to the main stem. They usually have a swollen base known as the ovary. My females, you can relate. That usually contains the female reproductive organs. Now, one single papaya tree can produce both male and female flowers, allowing for self-pollination and making it true that they are in fact classified as a bisexual plant, or at least they can be, depending on the plant itself. That also means subsequently that the fruit can develop without the need for cross-pollination from another papaya plant. And listen, I don't know how long the grocery store has been lying to us, but way too long, okay? Because these facts blew my mind. I wanted a bisexual plant. <laughs> and well, of course, as it grew, it soon became ready for another new home, so I made sure to repot it, and I even saw the roots sticking out from the bottom, so I knew it was ready to form new roots in a new home. When I went to repot it, I did notice, though, that it got a bit root-bound. I definitely could have repotted this earlier, but that is okay, because you live and you learn, and the process of growing papaya is darn well all trial and error. <coughs> you already know that by now. <laughs> but you know what fixed it up good? It stayed outside for two more weeks until the winter came. Don't worry, it didn't die just yet. But I am from Canada. And if you know anything about the Canadian winters, it's a very depressing state of mind to be in during the months of November to March, when the white fluff starts coming down from the sky and the clouds and all of our dear children of plants having to come inside with us so we don't throw all our hard work in the garbage. But that also means that this was the time that we needed to bring our papaya plant inside because the winter came and I was very nervous because papaya trees are tropical plants. They need the right conditions to survive. So I really didn't want it to die after spending eight whole months growing this thing. Listen, if we can grow papaya in 18 months, that means we only had like nine more months left or something. Do the math for me. Thank you. But I hoped for the best, did one last repotting in a slightly bigger pot, and then I brought the plant inside hoping for the best, not expecting the worst. Okay, maybe I was, I'm not sure, but I waited a whole nine months till the summer came around. And even though during the winter I was keeping this thing in my grow box, this is what ended up happening to our baby papaya plant. <laughs> I shed a few tears and you darn well already know that I was not happy with these results because I wanted a papaya tree that actually yielded real papayas and in Canada to boot. Plus, if you can grow a 20 foot papaya tree in 18 months, I knew we needed to try this again. So I walked over to the local store. Oh, who am I kidding? I darn well sprinted and got another papaya. Brought it home and I was so excited to cut it open. This time I cut open my papaya, revealed the dark little gelatinous seeds, removed some of that sticky layer to reveal the inner hairy seed and got some of the seeds in a little cup of water. This time I soaked the seeds for 15 minutes. I did this because I thought maybe soaking the seeds will help them germinate faster and remove any excess papaya flesh off the seeds to prevent any mold. Once 15 minutes passed, the water turned bright orange and I knew they were ready to be removed and placed on a damp piece of paper towel. This time though, I knew that the germination rate would be faster with the hairy outer layer of skin staying on the seed, so we did not peel that off, but I did remove the gelatinous layer that stayed stuck to any of the seeds that we were soaking in the water. There were a few that needed some help and we got them ready to germinate. I, I mean germinate. I also did prick the tip on some of the hairy seeds. Don't get any thoughts here. We're only doing this to prepare for germination. But I did this so I could give them a little head start so that when the tail did sprout it had an easy time breaking through that hairy shell. Plus, like our other papaya, some seeds came without that hairy layer and we still added those to the paper towel too just in case. Then the hardest part came, waiting for them to sprout. And since we already knew at this point that it could take anywhere from three weeks to three months to sprout, I kept them in a sunny spot, learned from the time before, and checked on them after about three, four weeks. The seeds did not yet sprout though after a full four weeks, even in the sun, and some even looked to be molding over a little bit, so I switched out the paper towel with a new damp one, sealed it back up, and waited three more months. I actually ended up forgetting to check on my paper towel for three months. I didn't mean to wait three months, I literally just forgot, and after I realized that I almost forgot, I ran to check and remove the sealed paper towel to see the little sprouts poking out. Listen, I got to admit, I didn't water the paper towel during those three months, but if you're trying this, make sure you don't forget to check on them for the three months and also make sure you keep your paper towel damp. 
You don't want it sopping wet, but a nice damp environment for them to grow. You want to mimic the tropical environment. But as you can so clearly see, the papaya seeds grew so nicely and it was a very good thing that we made sure to try germinating several seeds just in case they didn't all sprout. It looked like we got about 20 or 30 sprouted seeds here, so you know what we had to do next. We got them in a new soil home and waited for our papaya tree to grow. I actually had so many seedlings that I got them in two separate pots and waited for them each to sprout individually. And as I waited for my papaya plant to grow, I learned that there are actually white papayas in the grocery store or green, I guess, and you can buy them and eat them and grow them. I was lucky enough to find one and get my hands on one. I learned white papayas are actually just an orange papaya, but they're picked at a different stage of development. So they have a different taste, a different texture, a different appearance. And honestly, I found it pretty cool how papayas can be harvested while they're still green on the tree because they continue to ripen after picking, but they do stay green and they don't turn orange. And of course, we attempted to grow the seeds inside of this white papaya. I removed the seeds, you know the drill, tasted the fruit of course, which ended up tasting something like a cooked jicama. It was better than the orange one because it didn't smell like doo-doo, and <laughs> then I got the seeds on a damp piece of paper towel to get them ready for germination. I also learned that papaya seeds can be used for digestive support or even to get rid of internal parasites. I'm sure you've seen that all over the viral internet. The seeds apparently contain natural compounds that are said to help expel certain types of parasites from the gut. So to actually use papaya papaya seeds as a potential natural remedy for both parasites and digestive support. You can collect them, clean them, make sure they're from a ripe papaya, and then chew them. You can even crush them with a sweetener or just swallow them whole. You might see benefits. Plus, I also learned that there's this protein in papayas called papain. Not sure if I pronounced that correctly, but it is essentially the superhero of enzymes and papaya fruits and all fruits because it can be used for things like ready to have your mind blown, tenderizing meat, clarifying beer, processing dairy, and also in some medicinal applications. When applied to meat, the papain breaks down tough muscle fibers and makes the meat more tender and easier to chew. With the beer, it helps remove proteins and particles from the beer, which results in a clearer and more visually appealing final product. And with the dairy production, the protein can be used to break down milk proteins, and it's even sometimes used in the production of dairy products like cheese and yogurt. So cool. But in terms of the medicinal applications, it can be used as a digestive aid, as an anti inflammatory by alleviating symptoms of conditions like arthritis, sprains, and strains, and it can even break down dead tissue and promote the faster healing of wounds. Plus papain, that protein, it's even sometimes added to toothpaste and mouthwash because it's said to help break down plaque and whiten your teeth. And don't forget skincare. The protein is often found in cosmetics. They are literally the king of seeds. Anywho, as I wait for my white papaya seeds to grow, if they ever even will because the seeds might be less viable for growing since they're picked from the tree early, I ponder at the thought of how exactly I'm gonna grow my own 18 foot papaya tree in just 18 months all the while living in Canada. If we're lucky, soon our papaya plants will grow up and look like this. And even if that doesn't happen by the end of this summer, maybe it will by next. So it all started with one orange papaya, that turned into a second orange papaya, a white papaya, and a whole learning process of how to grow papaya from seed in a number of ways. And of course, so that you can grow it successfully the first time around instead of like the 10th like me. <laughs> That's why I do this first so that you don't have to. Listen, I wanted to try growing a papaya plant from papaya seeds, and even though we haven't yet grown our 18 foot tree, I still have faith, we just gotta give it time, around another year or so. <laughs> so two years, a bunch of papayas, and the start story of what exactly happened when I attempted to grow papayas from papayas. Listen, this is only further proof why you shouldn't buy your plants, but grow them from seed instead. The way that I see plants is essentially as a reflection of how we as humans can grow too in our own ways. So go get a papaya that is of dual sex, grow it from seed, and update me on your process because I love staying updated on what you guys grow. I've always wanted to grow a chocolate plant that I can eat, so I got the fruit that chocolate comes from. And yes, I can in fact confirm that chocolate is the salad. I've also always wanted to make my own chocolate, so we took 10 seeds to grow into a plant and the rest for our chocolate salad to make chocolate. And my besties, you're all probably wondering if I called him yet. I didn't. And so it began. Well, this is a cacao pod. Inside are the seeds that we ferment roast and grind to make chocolate. The seeds, they're covered in a white sticky pulp that's high in sugar, but you can consume it. It's really good. 
Some people make jams, liquors, drinks, other desserts, but it's got a tangy flavor and to me it tastes like a lychee mixed with a mangosteen. It's one of the most unique and best fruits I've ever tried and I would eat 10 of them if I could. But the cacao seeds are what finally get turned into chocolate. The seeds, they're like a dark chocolate mosaic and in order to grow it, we're gonna have to remove that outer gelatinous layer of skin from the seeds to reveal the inner cacao nibs. And botanists say that the 30 to 50 seeds that lie in the pod can even germinate in 24 hours. So we got to work. We peeled each seed so we could prep them to sprout the little baby tails. Then we placed our seeds in orderly fashion on a damp piece of paper towel. We sealed that in a glass jar and we started the daily timer, spritzing it with water religiously to keep it damp and give it the right environmental conditions to grow. And we also planted some in soil so that we could optimize our chances of growth in case the germination failed. I waited seven days and after the first 24 hours passed, something insane happened because the little tails, they started to sprout out. A couple days passed, they started to grow tails. Day three and four came around and I was still so excited for our chocolate plant. I thought, hmm, what could go wrong? Everything's going so right. And of course, I kept religiously spritzing it every other day with more water to keep that paper towel damp. You know what they say, you never know until you try, but you gotta take good care of it. But day five and six came around. It did look like the seeds were starting to darken. I started to wonder if I needed to keep the outer gelatinous white layer of skin on the seeds so that they could germinate because they looked to be getting a bit moldy and I wasn't sure why they were getting dark either. But if we know anything, it's that plants are all trial and error. And sometimes you have to try many times and some mold is okay, but this was some pretty sketch mycelium. Well, I also had my grow box handy and by day seven, I realized if I wanted to save these little lives, I had to put the last seeds standing in my grow box to give them the optimal conditions to grow. And don't worry, you don't have to wait until next week for results because I wouldn't do you dirty like that. We got all the results in this video. So we got the seeds in my grow box. And after we did that, of course, we had to continue religiously checking the seeds in the soil. They were looking really good. I was very happy and I went back to the grow box a couple weeks later, made sure the seed was still alive and thriving. It did look like it shrunk up a little bit, but it's nonetheless doing very well. But pro tip, don't touch them so much because I swear that had something to do with the failure of germination rates in comparison to my other plants. But Cacao pods are also exotic fruits, so you really never know what will and won't grow in the freezing temperatures of the harsh winters of Canada. They seemed like they were doing so well so far in the grow box. But if you're as invested on an emotional level to this as I am, then listen up, because about two weeks passed after I put my seeds in my grow box, and like I said, sketch mycelium. But nonetheless, they were looking incred. I was very excited and thought we were well on our way to growing a chocolate salad. I actually also put a couple of them in my grow box and some of them had lots of potential, but the tails were actually starting to have some sort of growth traction and some nice roots were shooting out of the sprout, so I put it back in its home and I left it. But the next week I went to check on them and they also started to turn black like the ones that were germinating on the paper towel and the ones in the soil. Of course I was still checking. They seemed pretty dead but I was determined to succeed. So you know what I had to do? I got my hands on another cacao pod, but this one must have been a different variety because it was something out of Rick and Morty. The seeds were purple and the flesh seemed like it was rotting. My fingers and my hands turned orange. I was really not down for this. And I was just happy we had the second cacao pod because I didn't care how we opened it. What really mattered was the seeds. I also got a lot of the rotten flesh juice in my eye. It was a crazy experience. I almost questioned my sanity at one point. It was a true disaster. But when you're at rock bottom, the only way that you can go is up. So after crying a little bit and making sure I didn't have an eye infection, I got to work and I got all the seeds and I peeled them all nice and, and dandy, my orange hands and everything, but the seeds kind of looked weird, like something was off with them. Open the exact moment that I got this juice in my eye. Oh my God. It's literally the worst idea ever. What the? Right now. It's a very difficult time, okay? But none of that mattered. The only thing that mattered in this moment to me was growing a chocolate plant in Canada, especially when it was the winter. So we took the seeds, spent a few hours separating them all. They still looked kind of sketch, not gonna lie. But I got them on a piece of damp paper towel in orderly fashion, waited a week within seven days. I'm telling you, sketch mycelium follows us everywhere. 
So you know what we needed to do. Another cacao pod number three. This one, it seemed promising. We extracted our seeds, peeled that outer gelatinous layer of skin off and got them in orderly fashion on a damp piece of paper towel and waited seven days. And this is what happened. It was a little bit more promising, but still, sketch my cilia. But there were a few little golden tails, so I put those in my grow box. I was still determined as heckin' to grow a darn chocolate plant, so you know we got cacao pod number four. This time, I was on vacation in Florida, and I'm like, well, I have the perfect growing conditions in my environment to grow chocolate, and it's gonna work, so I took the seeds. You know what we did, got the seeds ready to grow, and seven days passed, another seven Seven days and they looked really really good so I changed the paper towel I went and looked at them at another week and it didn't look like it grew but it looked like it shrunk but at this point I traveled from Florida to LA and I was like okay you know I wasn't satisfied I knew where I went wrong with some of these things, so I thought, okay, we're gonna grow these ones. Cacao pod number five, get them on a piece of damp paper towel. I'm determined as heckin'. Cacao pod number five is the last one that we're gonna try to grow this plant, and if it doesn't work, then we're just gonna heckin' and make chocolate. By the way, the skin is so good. It's all edible, it tastes so sweet, it's like a lychee, but I took the seeds, got them prepared to make chocolate, but I also took some of them to grow. I even added cinnamon to prevent that sketch mycelium. And the tails again, they were looking okay, but they also just shrunk up. So after months of trying to sprout these seeds, failing time and time again, I thought, it's finally time to make chocolate with these seeds. We still have the ones in our grow box and hopefully they'll grow. Frustrated but not defeated, I really need some chocolate salad right now. I changed the approach a little bit to make something delicious with the cacao pods, the leftover seeds. We roasted the cacao beans, we removed the shell, we ground them into a powder, mixed them with sugar, added a splash of milk and blended it. And after a few hours, I had chocolate. But this chocolate, it was like the texture of a brownie and it tasted really good, but it was a thick dark chocolate. And I wanted to make one that was nice and runny chocolate. And chocolate that was a little bit more sweet because I don't think I added enough sugar. So I made a second round of chocolate. Really should have gotten a chocolate mold, but this time I was creative. I used baking cups as my mold and I still think it had to be a bit more creamy, maybe needed more milk. I'm not really sure, I'm not a chocolate. Chocolatia still worked out really well, and this time it even tasted so much better than the last time. So, five cacao pods, two chocolate making sessions, and one surviving chocolate seed that's still in its grow box home. These cacao pods had me in a chokehold, and they're not releasing me until I grow a darn chocolate plant successfully. It's definitely safe to say that this was like nothing that I ever tried before and although we didn't fully succeed in growing a full-blown plant with cacao pods growing on it, we did learn that sometimes failure can lead to unexpected and delicious discoveries and who knows. Maybe we'll try again with cacao pod number six in a little bit, but I did say that I always wondered if chocolate was easy to grow, and I pretty much made it happen and got my chocolate salad too. And I never called him, by the way. So thanks so much for watching and being part of this chocolate growing journey with me. I turned this water bottle into 3D filament for my printer, and now I wanna show you how I did that and what I'm printing. Well. I drink a lot of water, specifically those three liter bigger ones, and I came to a point where I was recycling a lot of water bottles. And I had just gotten this 3D printer because I wanted to print things for my garden this summer instead of spending like a million dollars on all of my gardening supplies and trellises and seeds. You know, the life of an urban gardener princess. Well, I got tired of throwing all of this plastic out. And yeah, I could have just drank tap water, but I'm a spring water queen. So I knew I wasn't gonna stop buying the water bottles anytime soon, but I wanted to find a way to stop contributing to all of the plastic related problems in our environment. And that meant the only way that I could do that was to figure out a way to repurpose these water bottles. As I continued to print things for my garden, I noticed that the filament that gets extruded through the printer looks oddly similar to plastic. And if I could just find a way to take one of the many water bottles that I had and turn it into filament that I could then feed through my printer, I could not only save so much money on filament because they're like 40 bucks each and I go through them quick like the urban gardener princess I am, but I could also contribute to a more green and sustainable environment through repurposing my own plastic and ensuring 
ensuring that the water bottles didn't end up in a landfill somewhere or in an ocean somewhere that the turtles then choke on and die. And listen, we all know that I wanna be the mother of all turtles. So therein, my journey began. That was like December, but the problem was I'm a garden princess. I'm not an engineer and I'm not an electrician, but I had to figure out how to build this machine called the Pedimentor Filament Maker so that I could then cut my water bottles into strips, even strips in diameter, and then feed them through my self-built machine. And then use that filament that comes out on the other side of that machine that I built into my 3D printer. Cool, right? Nah, it's freaking awesome. Plus, we all know that on this channel, it's all trial and error. So I got to work. And remember, this was December. So by the beginning of January, the new year, new me, I became an electrician and I became an engineer. Listen, I set my mind to doing this and I was not gonna fail. Well, I did fail, a lot. But I was determined as heckin' to be the coolest person ever and accomplish this task that I had no idea where to even start with. So, I ordered all the pieces, I followed some YouTube videos to get the wires all connected, I ran into so many problems, and I do have another video explaining that process in more detail, which you should totally go check out because there were a lot of problems. And I was lucky enough to also get some help from some people I met from a Facebook group that are also building this machine. There's like 5,000 of them. And they happened to run into some of the same issues that I did, thankfully. And they helped me fight the battle of these issues and climb the summit of turning plastic water bottles into 3D printer filament so that I could become the queen of turtles. It was so complicated to even cut the water bottles into even strips with the right diameter diameter so that I could melt them properly through my extruder. And I had to find the right stretching point temperature too, which was also really hard. I do plan on optimizing these processes so that it can happen even more seamlessly. But listen, you gotta hear the rest of the story because it is intense and it is amazing. Anywho, once that machine was built, it was time to start making the filament. I ran into even more issues here because I didn't realize at first that I had to put the plastic through the nozzle before heating it up. So I spent like a month heating up the machine first and then attempting to pull the plastic strips through and right before I was about to give up, just kidding, I never give up, I reminded myself that I'm not melting the plastic. I'm really only stretching it to the point where it can be pulled through the nozzle and then attached to my pulley and filament therein could be made. And don't worry about the fumes since it's not being melted, only stretched. It's really not that bad for you. It's like making a fire or melting anything else that you would melt. Anywho, so once I got the twerks worked out, we finally had filament. My pulley also needed some optimization because it wasn't pulling properly and that's still a work in progress. But the point was, even though I spent five hours pulling the filament onto the pulley manually, we finally had filament that I was at that point so excited to try and extrude through my 3D printer. The settings on my printer all had to also be changed for this material because instead of a regular piece of filament, the plastic strips from the water bottle were just stretched to an oval shape. So technically there was a little air pocket right in the middle of the filament like a straw. So that meant, of course, the settings needed to accommodate that hollow part of the filament and the speed and the bed temperature and the flow rate too needed adjusting. So I went at this for weeks, okay? It had already taken me one month to figure out how to cut my bottles into strips evenly with the right diameter, two months to build my pedimenter filament maker machine and become an electrician and engineer, and then another full month to figure out the right printer settings to actually print something successfully. I know we were all really excited for that, but remember, I didn't care how long this was gonna take me, and if you're an engineer or an electrician, you're probably laughing right now at the time span that it took me to build this thing. But if you're a communications major like me, you're probably impressed. Thank you very much. <laughs> so finally, after numerous tries and multiple weeks passing me by and a number of people in that Facebook group helping me out to find the sweet spot settings, I finally saw the light at the end of the tunnel because it was working. Here we go. I cannot even begin to tell you the rush of joy that I felt when I finally saw that plastic coming out of the extruder because trust me, this took me so many tries. It wouldn't even come out at all until this very moment, so this was huge. And of course, even though it came out from the side when it started to print, it wasn't working and I figured, okay, maybe there was a clog. It gets clogged so often, so I went back to electrician mindset and I fixed it and then went at it again. I attempted to print a little square from my shrimp tank because a pack of six of those are like 30 bucks at the store, but printing six of them here would cost me maybe 10 or 20 cents. And guess what? I stood by that printer all day, waiting and waiting. Oh 
My God, you guys, look. That is a plastic water bottle printing something for my shrimps. I finally may have figured out because I expect more roadblocks along the way, but I'm like dancing right now. Let's see if it can actually print the whole thing. I'm like freaking out, where is it? That's the plastic. I know I have to clean it, don't. Don't come at me. <laughs> Some of the little cubes melted and didn't work properly, but finally my cube was printing. It looked like it was successful and it was almost done. Not without a few mistakes, however. <laughs> That's a success, okay. I'm trying it again. I'll leave it for longer this time, but it just looked like it was, yeah, let's try again. But the final one that I attempted, that really worked and then it was almost done, okay? It's all trial and <clears throat> oh. And even though it did for some reason melt at the end of it and there's still more that I have to figure out, I was so excited. Jumping for joy at the fact that this urban gardener princess was now about to upgrade her throne spot to the queen of turtles. There was only one more problem with this cube. See now it like messed up the Z axis and now it's not lined up. Like Oh, I'm gonna pause it. But I don't understand how that happens. Like, is it supposed to have printed something already? Like, this is a success though. I'm just so puzzled right now. I, I don't understand. It's going so well. I'm thinking, let's try this again. Have faith, because look at this. Yeah, this is supposed to be a little square for my shrimps, but then you can see where it stopped like extruding. So let's try again. Q P E T. Got all the settings. Yeah, see the film it fell out. It stopped. Yeah, okay, I'll put it back in. Ah! Guys, we just wanna print something, but this is the best thing that we printed so far. Just so weak the film. Let's see if it's coming out. Yeah. So I literally have to stand here pushing it down like I, I don't think that's a possibility. Then I figured it out and printed it. Okay, I'm sorry, but just it's it's all trial and error. We already all know that. But listen, this was a success. And I'm gonna figure out all the twerks that I'll need to figure out until we get it right and start printing even more stuff for the garden. But we literally, like this is just the coolest thing I've ever done in my entire life and I feel so good about it. So for me, the moral of this story is that for one, you can truly do anything that you set your mind to if you're consistent with it and you really wanna make it happen. And for two, you can be more sustainable and contribute to a more green and healthy environment by finding ways to repurpose your plastic, especially in those ways that serve your passions, like gardening or 3D printing or bug metamorphosis or aquatic plant life. I'm gonna try and make a video of me actually putting this machine together because a lot of you have been asking me how and I want more of you to be able to make it yourself so that you too can be more sustainable at home and be the coolest person ever. But this whole thing with all the parts that I ordered cost me about 300 Canadian dollars which yeah, it is pretty expensive, but it's totally well worth it knowing that spending that money would help repurpose plastic in a way that could actually impact the entire world globally. To change and shift our ways of thinking about recycling, about using plastic, and the different effects that this all has on the environment around us. I was literally watching this Earth video the other day, admiring how stunning the Earth is and thinking, wow, there's so many animals and so many plants and so many mountains, and then there's humans, and we gotta find ways not to do that. We gotta be like the animals in the mountains. Okay, but seriously, thank you so much for watching. If you liked this, drop a comment on any suggestions you have for me as to what I should print, but I was thinking I would try printing some water bowls for the turtles at the zoo and bring them and meet all the turtles. And I'm also in the midst of designing my summer garden right now and I really want to figure out a way to print some really tall trellises for outside so that my plants can grow really big on my apartment balcony. You know, urban garden princess turned throne queen mother of turtles. <laughs> but the problem with that is that the filament may melt in the sun 
sun outdoors, so my plants. And that's because you need a specific material for 3D printing if you're gonna bring them outside in the summer. I went through that mistake already and I had like seven pots melt on me, so I figured that one out too. But I'm gonna talk to my friends in that Facebook group and see if there's a way that I could print this type of material and bring it outside and not have it melt. So if that's a possibility, then great. And if not, it's okay because we're just gonna print stuff for inside. I took five kiwis and experimented on them to see if we could grow our own kiwi fruit. At least what I thought would be kiwi fruit. One kiwi turned into a chain reaction of trial and error experiments that taught me exactly how to grow kiwi at home the first time so that you can too. Well, this is the story of what happened. It all started with this kiwi. I took it, cut it open, extracted the seeds with a utensil and got them on a piece of paper towel. Spritzed that with water and then I folded it and sealed it up in a bag, airtight. But then the hardest part came, waiting for the tails to sprout. I kept checking them religiously and finally, after about four weeks, I opened the paper towel to see little baby tails growing and at that point, I knew they were ready for a new home. But I had over 20 little baby kiwi seedlings that sprouted on my paper towel and I knew that I needed to give us options here just in case this happened to fail. I decided I would experiment. I did two things to make that dream a reality and give us optimal conditions for successful growth. First, I planted some baby seedlings in soil that I would keep outside in a little pot. Next, I planted some baby seedlings in my grow box that I would keep indoors. Well, of course, the hardest part came again waiting for the tails to germinate even more inside the soil beds. I was excited to see what would grow faster, indoor or outdoor, grow box or natural light. And well, this was the progress of the grow box kiwi. And this was the progress of the kiwi that we kept outside. But I was confused as ever to see that the plant I left outside was growing so slowly that I thought it actually stopped growing altogether for a few weeks. And the grow box kiwi plant was actually turning red. I later learned the red could either be due to too much sunlight, which we knew was not the case because it was in the grow box indoors, or it could be a sign of stress or nutrient deficiency since kiwi plants require specific soil conditions to thrive. And although I didn't throw the plants out, of course we wouldn't do that. As I waited, I got pretty curious to learn why the kiwi plant wasn't growing as fast as some of my other plants, like my watermelon and carrots, next to it turning red altogether. I just wanted it to happen faster, okay? During this time, of course, I was always looking for some snacks. And one day, as I was scrummaging around my fridge to find a snack, I realized I had this old kiwi that was about to go moldy. I think that you know exactly what I was thinking. I was about to get to work. I knew if we grew 100 baby dragons from one old and moldy dragon fruit, then we could surely grow 100 baby kiwis from one old and moldy kiwi fruit. And if you haven't seen that series, go watch it after this video. It's quite hilarious. But so, I packed them in soil, covered it up nicely, and that was the easy part. The hardest part? Waiting to see if we would get lucky and have little baby kiwi seedlings in just a few weeks. Well, lo and behold, I waited patiently, and if you're trying this at home, know that sprouting kiwi seeds, if they're placed in a sunny spot and watered frequently enough, will grow baby seedlings in about four to five weeks. It could be less, it could be more, it just depends on the environmental conditions you're able to provide to it, as well as the hardiness of the zone that you live in. And that's just about how long it took for my kiwi kiwi seedlings to sprout. And as I waited for them to get even bigger, I gotta admit, I got a little bit of a kiwi obsession and I know that this sounds crazy, but I grew a kiwi plant from the seeds inside of my drink and it actually grew into a huge plant. Hear me out. I was drinking the drink, the one they got rid of at the place we do not name because I spent too much of my money there on espresso and I realized there were little kiwi seeds floating in my drink. Well, you already know we had to grow them and we needed options here. I tried germinating some on a piece of paper towel and I've tried planting some in soil to see which would sprout first. I removed the dehydrated seeds from my drink, smashed them down on a cutting board to loosen the seeds and then to make sure the seeds were actually viable for growth, I used the floating seed test method to make sure we knew exactly which ones would sprout. The ones that float are not viable for growing but the ones that sink are actually good to grow and we got a quite a few sinking seeds. I definitely thought that we were about to turn into kiwi queens because all you need is one and we had like 10. 
then I took the seeds that sang, placed them on a piece of paper towel in orderly fashion, then placed some of the fruit directly in soil. I gotta admit, I got a bit lazy to do that floating seed test method all over again when I could just plop the kiwi fruit pieces right in soil. So we did just that, and once they were all inside, I covered it with more soil and waited. First I checked on the germinating seeds. At first I was really excited to open the paper towel to see that the little seeds looked like they were starting to poke out little tails. But after about five days, the tails seemed like they started to shrink or they just weren't really growing and I was losing a bit of hope because, but really banking on this soil key. Well, this was the progress of the soil plant and boy was I excited when I walked outside one morning to see that there was one little sprout. And what did I tell you? In order to be a kiwi queen, all you need is one little sprout. I basically jumped for joy and watched it daily. And as soon as it grew big enough, the winter was about to come around in full force since I live in Canada, which most of you know. And if I wanted to give this plant a real shot at survival, I had to bring it inside and place it in my grow box. I did just that, but I was nervous it would turn red like the first one we tried, but nonetheless, I really had no other choice. And this was the progress. Can you believe it? A whole winter passed, and by the end of it, this is what it looked like, and it was ready to be placed back outside. So you know I did just that and I waited for it to sprout even faster since the ones outside are prone to growing a lot faster. And I also learned that it's actually pretty good for your plants to bring them inside for the winter and then place them back outside for the summer because it helps them branch out more and grow hardier. So I had a lot of faith until one day. I went outside to see my dog running after something and I was like, oh no, I gotta go check the plant. But this is what the plant looked like. And guys, we have a garden doggy who barks and chases after the squirrels when they come, but I still could not combat those families of 17 because they let their children feast on my child. So immediately I brought it inside, but I was feeling really defeated at this point because I spent almost one full year growing this thing. But the only good thing I knew about this is that sometimes plants flourish even more when you cut their stem off. If you've seen my avocado journey, then you know it really works. And even though in this case it was bitten off by those angry families of squirrels, it only really meant that maybe it would survive and flourish even more. It was also a continuous process of teaching the skills of patience and perseverance and trials and errors. You already know that by now, but these things truly are like children. And guess what? As soon as I brought it inside, it started to sprout again and like really fast. I decided I was definitely keeping that inside from now on and as I waited for it to continue growing, I learned something pretty fascinating. That there is something called kiwi berries. They're essentially tiny kiwis and they're so darn cute and I knew my kiwi journey would not be complete without attempting to grow some baby kiwi berries. Small but mighty, they're basically just a miniature version of the regular kiwi that we all know and love, but they're smaller and they're sweeter than regular kiwis. Their skin is more smooth, but it's edible. Kiwi berries are a great alternative to regular kiwis for people who find the fuzzy skin of the kiwis unappealing like me. But if you know anything about this channel, I wanted to grow a baby kiwi berry plant. And I learned along the way that you're actually gonna need two plants if you're growing them at home. One has to be male and one has to be female and that's because kiwi berries are dioecious. That means that male and female flowers grow on separate plants and that means that you need both male, male and female flowers to produce fruit because they need to pollinate each other in order to have tiny baby kiwi children. And I actually heard about these little things over two years ago and I was on the hunt for them for all those years but you cannot find them anywhere in Canada. They're actually native to Asia, they were first grown in China, and they were first introduced to the USA and Canada in the early 1900s. Well finally I got lucky enough to find them and I sprinted home with them to taste them and, and grow them. I cut open the berry with a utensil, removed the seeds with a little tweezer, you can also do it with an unsharp knife. I rinsed the fruit away, but this is where you can also pat it away with a paper towel, and then you can also soak your seeds in water for 24 hours to soften their outer coating and encourage germination, and then subsequently try the floating seed test method to see if there are any viable seeds for growing. The ones that sink will grow. I didn't soak them and I didn't do the seed test either because I've successfully done it without that step and I just wanted this to happen. I was too excited to wait a whole nother 24 hours. I grabbed a piece of paper towel, spritzed it with water. The key to successful germination is a lightly damp towel, not a sopping wet one. I finally got them in orderly fashion. 
session, folded up the paper towel, sealed that up airtight, and waited for germination. If you're doing this at home, which you definitely well should be, and if you're not, then go do it right now, you'll want to ensure you keep re-spritzing your paper towel about two times a week. I like to keep my germinating seeds in a sunny spot, but controversially, a lot of botanists like to keep their seeds in the dark, but I find it makes them more prone to mold. And you also have to re-spritz the towel less if you keep it in a dark spot, but keeping them in the sun dries the towel more, so you have to add more water, but it's less prone to mold. And I find the drying out of the paper towel really helps those seeds grow faster. But then, of course, the hottest part comes, waiting for your tails to grow and then planting them in soil. Here's where you can add vermiculite, perlite, or mulch to your soil for aeration so that the soil doesn't get too soggy or moldy, and then you wait. But something that's really cool about the kiwis and the kiwi berries is that you can train the plant to grow vertically to conserve space, and to do this you just need to use a trellis or another structure and fix the leaves onto the support system. And plus, I was really excited for this to grow because baby kiwi berries are hardy. They can tolerate temperatures as low as minus 25 degrees Fahrenheit. Canadians are Celsius, but that's okay, we'll just pretend. And that makes them a good fruit option for colder climates, just like the ones we're growing in in Canada. Listen, if we had success growing dehydrated kiwi seeds from our drink into a full-blown plant, we can definitely grow the cutest fruit I'll ever eat. This ain't proof that good things come in small packages. I don't know what is. Okay, well, most good things, you know. And since this was just a few weeks ago, now I await the results of all my kiwi plants that I worked so hard to grow, that we worked so hard to grow. <laughs> so guys, what started as a single kiwi experiment evolved into a chain reaction of trial and error, revealing exactly how to grow kiwi at home the first time. I spent five months looking for sugarcane, and when I finally found it, I didn't stop at just trying to grow it. I figured out a crazy way to experiment with the juice and grow my own rock crystals. And did I successfully grow sugarcane in this two-year journey? Well, you're about to find out. Well, it all started with me believing that you can't actually grow sugarcane in a place like Canada because the winters are too harsh. And trust me, if you live in Canada or you've ever visited in the winter, you know that the cold temperatures can reach more than minus 40 40 degrees Celsius, and if you don't have a greenhouse, you're basically crap out of luck. Well, I'm on my way to purchasing a dream farm so I can build an indoor winterized greenhouse, but until that moment actually happens, the plants all have to come inside with me when the winter months start coming around, from about November to March. And as much as that sucks, if you know anything about this channel, we persevere. We fight the challenges and we do not give up until we successfully grow plants whether indoor or outdoor. Well. As I mentioned before, I couldn't find sugarcane anywhere. So I literally took a plane to California to try and get my hands on it. I frankly never even tried raw sugarcane ever before. It all began, I arrived to Cali, got my sugarcane from a cute little market. Had a very hard time actually obtaining the sugarcane because they usually just juice it, so they were very confused when I asked if I could buy the stem. <laughs> and I very well sprinted home to get to work. I was really excited to just taste the juice and get my hands dirty cutting it all up like a boss. I figured I would try to bring the sugarcane stems back with me to Canada, but I knew that would be hard, so we were in for a little journey here. I placed the sugarcane on a cutting board and trimmed about an inch from both ends to remove any dry or damaged parts, and then I positioned the sugarcane and started gently slicing away the tough outer layers, starting from the top and working my way down, but this gentle experience was not in fact gentle at all, it was actually really tough. It took me about two hours. Sooner than later, I started to reveal the juicy inner flesh. I soon learned that sugarcane is an incredible plant. It stores sweet juice in its stems and it's basically what I call panda bamboo for humans. The stalks store carbohydrates in the form of various sugars so when you cut off the surrounding layer of stalk and reveal the inner crunchy softer flesh, you can chew it and release the sugary goodness stored in the stems when you do. And the coolest part is that sugarcane actually isn't fruit because there's no seeds. So that means it's called classified as a stem, and who knew a stem could be so sweet and delicious? Well, clearly I never did until I flew my butt to California to find this thing. Well, once I successfully removed all the layers and about two or three hours later, I started to cut the sugarcane into smaller, more manageable pieces, and it was pretty easy to cut right through the stalk once the harder outer layer of flesh was cut away. I got one of the smaller pieces in my hand and popped it right in my mouth started chewing the juicy, softer inner flesh, sucked out that sweet juice while, of course, semi-enjoying the fibrous texture. And I had to chew it pretty carefully to avoid swallowing the fibrous fibers, but as I chewed, 
the fibers accumulated in my mouth so I ended up spitting them out into a bowl as I chewed through these delicious pieces of random stems that grow from our mother earth. I actually ate so many of these that the sugar must have given me a pretty large headache but it was totally worth it because I think it may have been one of the most unique moments of my life. But here is where I got hungry for more. I wanted to grow my own sugar cane, not only taste it, I wanted to experiment with the juice in unique ways to learn cool things I've never learned before. So I went back home to Canada and I got to researching. I spent exactly five months trying to figure out where I could obtain some sugarcane stalks near where I lived in the urban environment in busy city of Toronto, Ontario, Canada. Finally, I found sugarcane stalks. Immediately bought a stalk. Did a slow walk home. Oh, who am I kidding? I darn well sprinted home with it to try and grow it and experiment with it. Of course, I asked all of you to help me out, so I made sure I did it all right. And I even got some awesome footage from a friend in India who runs a sugarcane farm. So lucky for us, we get a little inside look on what growing an abundance of sugarcane actually looks like in various parts of the world. How awesome is that? But now was the time to get to work. And if you can get your hands on some sugarcane stalks too and you want to grow it at home or experiment with it, follow these steps carefully. Sugarcane. It's about my height. First, you'll need to take some stem cuttings. You'll cut the stalks into sections with at least two to three nodes each. A node is a point on a plant stem where leaves, branches, or buds are attached. It's a crucial part of the plant where growth and development occur, and it's what's going to ensure your plant grows successfully at home. In the context of growing sugar cane, nodes are important because they are where new shoots and roots will emerge. It's better if you plant these straight in the ground, but since I'm working with an apartment garden, we had no other choice but to plant it in a pot. So if you're planting in a pot, make sure that the pot drains well with lots of holes at the bottom and make sure to plant them in a very sunny spot and, you know, then the hardest part comes, of course, waiting for it to grow. Well, if you're lucky, your sugar cane plant should grow pretty quickly. You could actually have your own sugar cane stalks in just one year after planting them, especially if you have a large space and they're in the ground. Well, after I planted them, I had some leftover sugar cane and I knew I was gonna have to wait a while for these things to grow, so I decided to experiment and try and grow rock crystals. That's basically when you put some string hanging down in some boiled sugar cane juice or sugar water and you wait for the crystallization process to happen where something magical takes place. You better tell your teacher about this one. Well, I took my sugar cane stalks, blended them up, extracted the juice and placed the juice in a pot of boiling water, added a little bit of water and brought it to a low boil. And then I put that mixture in a glass jar with a little makeup brush hanging down in the concoction. And listen, honey, if you know me, you know I like options just in case we fail. So I decided to also do the same thing with white sugar so that not only I could see the difference in how rock crystals formed in different types of sugary substances, but to have at least one method that really worked successfully in case the other one failed. So I made the other mixture by adding three-fourths of a cup of white sugar to one cup of water, boiled it up on a low heat, and poured the mixture into a separate jar. I added string and a makeup brush to this one hanging down just in case the material of the makeup brush didn't allow the sugar crystals to form as well as the rope and to give us options of course. Also, I made sure to cover the tops of each jar with some paper towel so that no gnats got stuck in my mixtures and I waited seven whole days. Could barely sleep at night. I was dreaming of this sugar cane, but every other day I had to scoop off that outer crystallization layer off the top of the mixture and continue to wait. Well guess what? This is what the white sugar crystals ended up looking like. I was so excited that it really worked. I felt like a kid in a candy shop. And as I kept checking on the sugarcane concoction, I was saddened to see that this was a complete fail. Not quite sure what happened here, but there might have been too much water added to the concoction. However, it is just an example of why we try a few different methods when we plant the plants and experiment on them so that we're successful with at least one of them. Come on. I still though decided to wait a few more days to see how the sugarcane would turn out and if the crystals would end up forming, but they did not. And I was out of luck here because I didn't have any more sugar cane to boil up. So if you want to do this at home as a fun project with your friends, family, or even your students or your teacher, make sure that you use white sugar or figure out how to get the ratios of water to sugar cane juice just right and let me know if you do. But you don't know until you try. It's all trial and error. <laughs> don't you know that by now? And that's okay because I was still really excited about our results and Speaking of results, as we grew our sugarcane crystals, we were also waiting to see if the sugarcane plant started to grow at all before the summer came to a close. So it's natural that you're probably wondering if we actually grew a sugarcane plant or not. Well, an entire year passed. 
365 days. And as much as I wanted to tell you that it grew into an entire sugarcane field, I'm truly saddened to inform you that this, in fact, did not work. And I was really disheartened. But if you know me, I quickly picked my head up and realized that it may take longer since we're in Canada. And of course, you know, I wasn't throwing that plant out anytime soon. So I brought it inside for the winter, put it in my family of grow lights, and spent the entirety of seven months watching this plant inside, seeing virtually no progress. But then the summer this year came and I put it back outside, but it still hasn't sprouted up. But for some reason, I still believe that it still has a good shot at sprouting up, so we aren't throwing that. That one out. The best sign out of all of this though is that it did not die. It's kind of just dormant in the current moment. Honestly though, I just love the fact that this unique stem found stuck in the ground has so many different functions. It can be juiced, consumed like a drink, boiled, thickened, and spun to create raw sugar. It can be used to experiment in the classroom or at home. And what I found quite interesting is that sugarcane actually belongs to the grass family, which includes crops like wheat and rice. It was actually once a very major source of income for many plantations. There was even a time thousands of years ago, back in the day, you and me baby, when sugarcane was more expensive than gold. It's native to Asia, but it's also grown in many tropical and warm places around the world. It's very highly developed in India, just like we saw from our friend who sent us those videos. But you guys, it all started with me believing that you can't actually grow sugarcane in a place like Canada, to successfully combating that idea and a subsequent two year journey of growing sugarcane, experimenting with it in weird ways, and the unbelievable learning experience that accompanied getting my hands dirty on these sweet stems. So now we continue to wait for our sugarcane plant to grow. It took me three years to turn my home into an avocado bonsai forest. Throughout that time, I've attempted to grow and experiment with over a hundred avocados that now each tell a story that I want to share with you so you can grow avocados at home successfully the first time. So if you want to grow the biggest berry there is, yeah, avocados are botanically classified as a berry, you've stopped at the right channel. Well, it all started with this avocado right here. I took it, removed the inner seed, and tried to peel the skin off, but it wouldn't come off. So I placed it in a cup of warm water for one hour and soon learned that the warm water helps the outer layer of skin slide right off. But if you do find that it's not working, just put it back in the water, wait another hour, and then you should be good. If you don't peel the skin off, this is what your avocado will end up looking like. So peeling the skin is a vital part of the process. But then I inserted three toothpicks into the sides of the avocado, a method not as easy as the one I later learned, and I'll tell you about that soon. And then I suspended the avocado seed in water and the hardest part came waiting for it to sprout it took about three weeks for the avocado seed to crack open and for the little root to sprout out from the bum of the seed the process of the tail actually growing out of the seed took a lot longer than I thought for a while there I wasn't even sure if it was gonna work but patience was key here because it worked just make sure you change your water every three days to keep it free from any bacteria but then you continue waiting and throughout the eight months that I waited for this thing to grow I learned that once the plant grows two or three leaves, experts actually cut their avocado stems in half. I know, crazy, right? But they say it's because it helps the plant to branch out and promote stronger growth rather than having the plant grow up too tall. And if you know anything about this channel, we persevere, we fight, and we don't give up until we successfully grow fruits at home. So of course, I decided to try this theory out for myself. Like the true scientist I am, I sat in my chair, and the moment I honestly dreaded came, I was second guessing myself as to whether or not I was actually about to cut this thing. I was about to cut this thing. I waited almost one year for this thing to grow, but I figured, okay, we're not gonna know until we try and I've cut it. I actually cut it in half. I'm crazy. But of course, I wasn't about to throw the stem out, so I added that back into the water to see if that would sprout as well. And it's actually you guys who told me that I cut the stem in half too far down the middle, so I was a bit nervous here. But finally, the day started to pass. And after mourning the loss of this avocado stem, I was really surprised to see the results. After only three days, the leaves on the stem I tried to save were dying, so I pulled those off and I thought, okay, let's see if the stem will sprout without any of the leaves. But the actual avocado stem that we cut was starting to morph into something truly 
amazing. And don't you know me already? In order to make sure that it actually worked, I grew two avocado plants alongside each other, but I only cut one and I left the other one uncut to make sure we could see the results with our own eyes with something that we could compare it to. And I waited another four months. The new growth on the stem that we cut started to happen in full force and it was looking fantastic. The stem, however, that I tried to save died. The one I pulled all those leaves off of. But you never know until you try. It's all trial and error. <coughs> you should know that by now. Come on. But to my surprise and upon comparing the two that we were growing alongside each other, it's safe to say that it was working. The leaves on the one that we cut looked almost porcelain, had a little bit of a darker color, the leaves were less brown than the other, and the actual stem seemed stronger too, with an overall strongular vascular plant stem and root system. Not only did it help the plant to branch out more, but it also grew back very fast and the leaves were so pretty. The plant that we did not cut, however, seemed to have weaker leaves, the foliage was wilting and browning a little bit, and it wasn't branching out as quickly as the one that that we cut although it had more leaves. I had many avocados growing with these ones because we needed a forest in our home, don't you know? So five more months passed and I made sure to pick off the brown leaves and cut off the brown parts of the actual leaves off of the one that we didn't cut. So as you can imagine, I was very pleased to find out that this theory was in fact confirmed and that experts were right in saying that cutting the stem off of your avocado plant will help promote growth and strength. I thought this was pretty fascinating and I took this and I didn't just stop at experimenting with the stem by cutting it. I wanted to see if I could morph this baby into a bonsai tree and since the one we cut in half grew two stems, we had a lot to work with. I didn't want a regular avocado forest, I wanted an avocado bonsai forest in my home. You can see though the point where we cut the stem and that was pretty cool. I figured I'd just twist the two stems together and wait to see what happens, but 100% worth it. The young shoots are very bendable and as the plant starts to age, the twists and turns will start to solidify and turn woody and you won't be able to undo it later on. Well, I left this to do its thing and grow and as it did, I continued to morph it into a, more of a bonsai tree as it grew. And Along the way, I learned a really cool fact that indigenous people historically used marker trees for navigation. They would choose a tree and shape it, kind of like just how we did with our avocado tree, and that shape would point towards a significant landmark. In a park near where I live, there are actually three marker trees along the trail and they are really cool. But as I waited, I realized all of these cool things that you could do with avocado trees, but I realized in order to actually grow avocados, it will likely take up to 13 years. <laughs> especially if you're growing from seed. But I wanted it to happen faster and I was determined as heckin to make that dream into a reality. So me and my drive to never back down, I also found out about these really big and fat avocados. But I had never tried them before and apparently they are very creamy. So naturally I had to try it. I got my hands on one and as soon as I opened it, I realized that there was no way that I was throwing this seed out and that maybe I could grow it in a way that would yield fruit in like two years versus the 13 that it normally takes. Plus I wanted an endless amount of bonsai trees, so I got to work. I was so excited to open this juicy, creamy avocado from the DR, but I opened it up to reveal that it didn't look as good as I had hoped. But that's okay because this technically wasn't for eating, it was for growing and the seed was bigger than my whole hand, so you already know the drill, we got to work. I washed it, dried it, peeled off the seed's outer layer of skin and placed it on a piece of saran wrap that I spritzed religiously every three days with water. It's like a child. Usually I use a glass jar and toothpicks, but this time I wanted to see if the avocado seed would grow in the saran wrap better than in water straight away. And I think I was right because soon this baby avocado started to grow a baby tail. But since it takes so long for the seed to sprout out, a little tail in between its little bum, I actually ended up forgetting about this thing for a few months. and. This is what it ended up looking like, so I had to figure out a way to get it in water without breaking all the roots, but luckily it was a success and before I knew it, it shot up and grew into a baby plant. And as it grew, at this point in time, 
It was all still a constant learning process, and I actually learned that you need two avocado plants growing together in order to actually yield fruit. But some of you also tried to convince me that you can't in fact grow avocados true to seed. So even if we grow the two plants alongside each other, no avocados will grow or some pretty warped ones will. Well, either way, I was okay with some warped avocados and I was not giving up here. I couldn't believe that until I saw it with my own eyes too. So of course, I ended up getting a little obsession with avocados okay I'm sorry I just wanted to wake up from my slumber and look at the beautiful darn well avocado bonsai trees filling up my home well at that point in time I had this bag of avocados that I forgot about and they ended up going bad and I thought back to the thing that I learned about needing two avocado plants to actually yield fruit so I thought you know what instead of throwing these in the garbage let's increase our chances of successfully growing our own baby avocados at home and get to work with this moldy bag of avocados. So you already know what I had to do. I started opening up all of these avocados to remove the seeds. Some looked okay for eating, and you already know we made some mean guacamole with those, and others looked pretty gnarly, ready for the trash. But after I successfully got all the seeds out, it was time to give them a nice little bath. I washed them, I dried them. It took me a couple of hours to peel that outer layer of skin off of the seeds and my hands even turned orange because I didn't soak them first. I got a little lazy. I wanted this process to happen really quick. So clearly I wasn't willing to wait an hour for these to soak in water evidence. But then I got each seed on a piece of damp saran wrap, placed those in the bag, and the hardest port, port came yet again, waiting for them to sprout. But soon they started to grow, and if I'm frank, these things were so cute! I think we increased our chances in actually yielding fruit here because the progress was amazeballs! Although a few of them did turn brown and die, most of them had a successful survival rate and started to turn out a little something like this. So it's safe to say that you should try this with many if you're trying this at home because some will survive some won't it's basically all trial and error but you already know that and then i decided it was time to bonsai experiment again since we had so many of these i took the ones that had sprouted a few leaves and started shaping them up this one looked like it had a little wiggle room to add some more warpedness and that was definitely a good idea the root systems were looking amazing and i was just overall pumped I just kept on growing avocados and kept on shaping them into these bonsai trees that all now are looking so good. But as I shaped one of the last bonsai trees from this avocado bag, my avocado obsession made me realize that I never even made guacamole. Wow. But I do have a secret recipe that you guys will love. And of course, I grew the seed from this beautiful avocado, don't even worry. But I scooped the meat out, added it to a bowl, and then added some garlic, some lime, some olive oil, some salt, my favorite ingredients. And then I actually have a secret ingredient that I like to add, don't tell anyone, but it's a little dash of Caesar dressing. I know some friends who like to use a little bit of mayo instead of Caesar, but it adds an extra kick that you never knew your guacamole needed. It gives it a light, creamy texture, and it's such a beautiful addition to the best appetizer there is. Unless you're allergic, then that would suck. <laughs> Anywho, go make this recipe for your snack right now. And by the way, the second last thing that I learned along this journey is the fact that you can apparently freeze your avocados right before they go bad, and when you take them out and let them thaw out, they are good as new. <laughs> Well, I was skeptical, so of course, I tried it so you don't have to. And since I had some avocados that were about to go bad sitting on my counter, it seemed like a good idea. Let me tell you, well, I had this avocado in the freezer for f about four weeks, and when I took it out and opened it, it looked pretty green. And as I went to fully cut it open, it was still a bit frozen, so I let it thaw out a bit. But then the ultimate truth was the taste test. Well, the results are that it tasted okay. It didn't necessarily taste like a fresh one, and after about an hour of sitting out on the counter, the whole thing seemed to turn a little bit brown, so if you're doing this, you probably should eat it right away. It is a good idea for food preservation. But if you can get your hands on fresh avocados, do that instead. It was worth it though, because I made sushi hand rolls, and I learned the different ways that we can store and preserve our food so that they don't go to waste. And the fact that we can actually contribute to a more sustainable and green environment around us through the foods we eat, store, and dispose of. Just never forget to grow the seeds. The last thing that I wanted to tell you is that this is actually what an avocado plant sounds like. It 
It's so cool to see that if you put electrodes on your plants, it can detect electric signals that can provide information about the activity and behavior of your plants. Here, I was using a device that amplifies the electric signals and converts them into sound. Sick. Anywho, well, it definitely is safe to say that now every time I eat an avocado, I married the idea of never ever throwing the seeds away. And this one choice has honestly made my home so beautiful and so green. It's basically raining avocado trees in my apartment and I absolutely love it. I give them away as gifts, I morph them into bonsai trees, and I doubt I'll ever stop growing them till the day I, you know. Anywho, what felt like hundreds of avocados and a three year journey and a beautiful forest now in my home. At the end of the day, the moral of the story is that you're stuck with me for 13 years to see if we actually grow the avocados or not. But we have so many trees now, so I'm confident that one of them will get pollinated and sprout avocados sooner rather than later. They're all starting to turn woody, and if we're lucky soon, the avocado tree will grow into this, and then into this. Hopefully the leaves will be less brown than this one. Well, as you know, on this channel, we take the seeds from inside exotic fruits and grow them into full-blown house plants that fruit. This week was a wild ride. Thank you so much for watching. Without you, it would not be possible for me to make these videos. I love you so much. Don't forget to like, comment, follow, subscribe, remember that I love you. And I'll see you next week.